Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. As you'll know if you follow the channel, one of the big challenges facing the Western world in terms of the pressure that they're applying onto Russia through the sanctions is the amount of natural gas that the European Union is buying directly from Russia. Russia has huge reserves of natural gas and because of the close proximity to Europe, over the last 20 years, numerous pipelines have been built by Russia and that supplies lots of countries in a really easy, convenient and cheap manner. And the problem we've got right now is because of the war in Ukraine and because of the sanctions, firstly we've seen Russia switching off the supply to various countries and secondly there's been a strong desire from Europe to stop buying that gas. But the problem that Europe has is that the alternative to natural gas in a gaseous form is to buy liquefied natural gas. And in order to use liquefied natural gas, you need to have a regasification plant, which is a huge facility which turns it from liquid back into gas. And so it's a real challenge being able to put that infrastructure in place. A lot of countries don't have coastlines, so they're having to do deals with other countries to set up a supply chain. And even the ones who do have coastline, there are logistical problems in terms of finding the right facilities, making sure the water's deep enough, and then having a connection into your existing system. So there's a lot of challenges, both from an infrastructure and the cost perspective. So realistically, it's likely to take at least six months before Europe is in a position where it can walk away from those gas supplies. And in order to get through that period, what the European countries have been doing is trying to fill their storage facilities as full as possible to make sure that they've got reserves of natural gas to get them through the winter of 22-23. Because if Russia does decide to turn the taps off overnight, then that would leave all of these countries exposed. And the problem that we've got is that a lot of countries, including Germany and Italy, who are two of the most dependent, use that gas to produce electricity and they also send it directly to consumers' homes and it's used for heating and cooking. So the last thing that any country wants through the forthcoming winter is having blackouts because they haven't got enough gas to make electricity and for consumers not to be able to heat their homes. That would be an absolute disaster. So in today's video, I want to talk about those storage levels because at the start of the war, it was identified that the storage levels were a lot lower than everybody wanted them to be. The EU has given a directive to all of its countries that they want to see the storage facilities at least 80% full by November 2022. And at the time of the war, they were significantly below that. So in today's episode, we'll have a look at which countries have the biggest exposure to Russian natural gas. We'll have a look at what the storage levels were in May, which was around two months after the war started. We'll then have a look at what the current storage levels are. And then finally today, I'll finish up with my summary as to what I think is likely to happen over the course of the next six to nine months as we go through the winter period in Europe, what the implications of this are for both Russia and the global economy. So before we get started on that, if I can ask you for a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Don't forget, I always include chapters so you can skip over stuff if you're not that interested in it. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to YouTube super thanks and membership, as well as buy me a coffee and Patreon. This chart shows the percentage exposure to Russian gas purchases in 2021 from a variety of European countries. In addition, it also shows the percentage of total energy consumption contributed by natural gas in those countries. So this essentially tells us how important gas is to that particular country. The three countries at the top of this list, Austria, Finland and Lithuania, all purchased 100% of their gas from Russia in 2021 which obviously indicates huge exposure. But the key issue here is to look over to the right-hand side of this chart, which gives us the percentage of total energy. Natural gas only accounted for 3% of Finland's total energy consumption, which means that Finland has a very low reliance on gas, which is just as well, because as you'll know if you follow the channel, Finland were one of the countries that were cut off by Russia for refusing to pay for gas in Russian rubles. Lithuania has an 11% exposure to natural gas, and Austria's dependence is 19%. So clearly you can see that this is a major issue for Austria. And if you follow the channel, you'll know that Austria is one of the countries who are struggling right now. And if you follow the channel, you'll know that Austria is facing major challenges right now. It's landlocked, so it doesn't have any coastline, which makes it much more difficult to set up its own LNG facilities. Unlike other countries, it can't just bring in a floating regasification vessel. It needs to rely on other countries around it. Moving down the list, in 2021, Slovakia bought more than 80% of its gas from Russia. 
And Hungary more than 70%. Hungary relies on natural gas for around a third of all of its energy consumption. So this is a massive exposure that they have. And because the country is relatively small, it's very difficult for them to be able to set up the infrastructure to replace the Russian supplies. And Hungary is the one dissenting country in Europe who stated that they do not want to reduce the amount of gas that they're purchasing from Russia. And because of this position, Russia have continued supplying the country. Poland also purchased around 70% of its gas from Russia in 2021. But one of the benefits that Poland has is that it only relied on natural gas for around 13% of all of its energy. Poland predominantly relies upon coal for the production of electricity. And it was the first country to come out and make a categorical statement that it would not be paying for gas in Russian rubles and subsequently had its entire supply switched off by Russia. Germany and Italy are the next two countries on this list and are the two biggest problems in Europe right now. In 2021, Germany purchased over 50% of its gas from Russia and Italy purchased around 40%. And the total exposure to natural gas was 27% for Germany and 31% for Italy. And this is the problem combined with the fact that these are large countries from a population perspective. So these two countries are now absolutely critical in terms of the European Union being able to stop buying from Russia and then applying the sanctions fully. Just finishing off this list, in 2021, France purchased over 20% of its gas from Russia, the Netherlands around 20%, and the UK around 10%. All three of those countries have now stopped buying all gas from Russia. This table shows the percentage of gas storage capacity that was filled by the European Union countries as of the end of May 2022. Russia's invasion of Ukraine commenced on the 24th of February. So this represents a period of two months post-war. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the video, the European Union recommended that all countries fill their storage capacity to 80% by November 2022. And what this chart shows is that the only two countries that had more than 80% at the end of May were Portugal with around 90% and Poland with around 84%. Spain came in number three with around 63%, Czech Republic 46%, Denmark a similar level, Italy had 41%, Germany around 38%, France also 38%, Latvia 36%, the Netherlands 30%, Romania and Slovakia 24%, Austria who I mentioned a moment ago had 100% exposure in 2021 and also has a large percentage of its energy requirements dependent on gas, only had around 23% of its storage capacity filled as did Hungary, who we also discussed are having major problems. Bulgaria, who are one of the first countries to have their supply switched off alongside Poland, had less than 20%. Croatia and Belgium had a similar level, and Sweden were down at 6%. So the overall summary of the situation as at the end of May is that a lot of countries were significantly below the 80% recommended level, and this is why there's been such a high degree of concern in Europe, because a lot of these countries are dependent on gas as part of their infrastructure. And without having sufficient storage available to them, it meant that they were completely exposed to the ongoing supply of gas from Russia. And if that supply was switched off, then that would leave all of these countries highly vulnerable to major problems. This table provides the details of the amount of gas stored and the percentage against total capacity for each of the countries in the EU. The line at the top here shows the aggregate position for the whole of the EU and shows that 74% of all of the storage capacity was filled as of the middle of August. So we've seen a really big increase. So let's have a look on a country by country basis at which countries have the most and which countries still have large exposure to Russian gas. Right at the top of this list is Portugal, which has 100% storage capacity right now. As we saw in the previous chart, Portugal was already above 89% at the end of May, but have now got completely full storage facilities. Poland is second on the list with over 99% storage, which is obviously really good news given the fact that Russia has already ceased supplying Poland. Sweden is third on the list with over 90% storage. Denmark has more than 91%. However, Denmark's exposure to gas is far lower than a lot of other countries on this list. They have a high degree of renewable energy in Denmark. Next highest storage level is France with just under 86%. And Spain is the last country that already hit the recommended storage level of 80% for the winter of 22. Italy's storage level is now above 77%, which is a huge increase from the 40% that we saw back at the end of May. 
And Germany comes in just behind Italy with 76%, which is double the amount of storage that they had at the end of May. Now, in terms of looking at the countries who are facing major challenges still, Austria's storage is now up to around 58% which is a significant increase from the 22% they had at the end of May. And it's a similar story for Hungary, who are now at 57% versus 22%. And the country with the lowest reported storage levels right now is Latvia. So overall, what this chart shows us is that there has been a huge drive by all of the countries in the EU to increase the amount of natural gas that they have in storage, all of these countries are concerned about what's happening in Ukraine. They're all working towards stopping all purchases of Russian gas, and they are desperately trying to get enough gas in storage to see them through the winter period because nobody really knows what's going to happen with regards to the pipeline gas. We've seen a stalling of the supplies. We've seen reductions in those supplies. Some of it has been blamed on maintenance and other issues, but there is a potential that Russia could switch off the gas supplies at any point. It could stop overnight. So all of these countries need to make sure that they've got as close to 100% capacity as possible to get them through that winter period. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because I think the level of storage that countries have is going to be a really important factor in terms of the sanctions. As it stands right now, European countries are still exposed. They're still at risk of not being able to have enough gas because it's very difficult to replace gas in a gaseous form with LNG. It can't happen overnight. So if your supplies of gas suddenly stop, then it's likely that you will have a shortage unless you've got something in reserve, you've got your own storage. So that is really what all these countries are working towards because in the short term, having enough gas in storage means that you become self-sufficient. You can buy that gas from Russia now, put it into your stores, and then even if Russia cuts off that supply, you can see yourself through the winter period. And that's the critical period because the worst case scenario for all of these countries right now is that they run out of gas supplies during the winter, which means that they can't produce enough electricity and people can't heat their homes. That's going to cause political unrest and tension. And it may well be that Russia decide that that's what they try to drive for. They try to create as much chaos in all of the other countries in order to give themselves a better position. And what we've seen from the charts we've just looked at is there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of natural gas storage between the end of May and the middle of August. So all countries are working really hard to get those storage levels up. Now, one thing I haven't covered off in this video is whether or not these storage facilities are sufficient to be able to keep supplying all of the countries. And obviously some countries have bigger storage areas than other. I reported in previous video that some of the German facilities were actually owned by Gazprom, but Gazprom walked away from that ownership. So the German authorities have taken control of those storage sites because that potentially was going to be a big political issue if Gazprom owned those sites and then refused to release that gas back into the system. But the overall assessment in terms of the storage capacity is that the EU sees the capacity as being sufficient to get all of the countries through in the worst case scenario that gas supplies are cut off from Russia. There are obviously some other options. We've talked about some countries moving back towards coal, reopening some of their coal power plants, and there's also the possibility of moving electricity between countries. So there are some alternatives in a worst case scenario. But the preferential position from the EU's perspective is that everybody prepares for the winter now and then there won't be major problems. And what we're seeing here is the European Union committing to moving away from purchasing energy from Russia. And I think realistically, we've now got to the point of no return. None of these European countries are going to go back to buying energy from Russia. So that creates a major challenge for Russia because they will now have to find a new home, a new place to sell this gas into. And the benefit that Russia has had is that the pipelines that they put in place are really convenient from their perspective as well. So it's good for the buyers, but it's also good for Russia. They've got pipelines feeding directly from their gas fields. And changing that supply chain is going to be a huge logistical problem for Russia because they'll have to convert it into liquefied natural gas. And that will take a huge amount of infrastructure and investment. And a lot of the gas fields that Russia has are in inhospitable places. They're in the Arctic Circle and other challenging environments. 
So it will take some technical know-how and a huge amount of money. Now, in the past, Russia have relied upon Western partners. They've teamed up with companies like Shell, and they've designed the plants for them. They've come in, they've paid for the plants, they've built the plants, they've got them operational, and then Russia shares in that revenue. Going forward, they won't have any of that help. So they won't be able to call upon the expertise or the financial investment. So Russia's going to have to find a huge amount of money to pay for these sites, and then they're going to have to design them and build them themselves. And that is going to represent a really big challenge for Russia because who's going to get into bed with Russia right now? If you've seen what they've just done to all of their partners in oil and gas, where they've effectively cut all of the relationships and taken over all of the assets, that isn't an attractive proposition if you're an Indian or a Chinese investor. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to put money and time and effort into a really long-term infrastructure project if you can run the risk of Russia turning around and saying, actually, we now own everything and you get nothing. That doesn't seem like a good deal for anybody. So it's a big challenge for Russia in terms of where they're going to get the money from. There's also a big challenge as to whether or not they've got enough expertise in the country. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that over 500,000 people have left Russia since the start of the war. And these generally are their best people. It's referred to the brain drain because it's generally the higher educated and more intelligent people in society who make the move. They see what's happening and decide that they don't want to stay in that environment. And that's what's happened. So there's been a lot of natural gas expertise that's left the country as the companies have pulled out. All of the foreign nationals have left. But we've also seen a lot of Russians leave. And that's going to present a major problem for Russia because they need their best people at times like this because they've cut all of their working relationships with the rest of the world. And if those best people have all defected and gone to other countries, then they're going to be left with a really big problem. So I think it's going to be really challenging for Russia to be able to find new markets, particularly because it's going to take them a number of years to get the infrastructure in place to be able to convert the gas into LNG. So what we will see over the next 12 to 18 to 24 months is a huge fall in natural gas revenues for Russia because they've lost all of these sales to Europe and they won't be able to simply sell it to China and India because they need to convert it into LNG before they can do that. In addition to those challenges, there's also the challenge of finding enough shipping vessels and being able to move the LNG because a lot of shipping companies have placed sanctions against Russia so they won't deal with them going forward and there just aren't enough ships in the world to be able to move the volume of oil and LNG that Russia needs to move because a round trip from Russia to China can take up to 70 days. Now obviously at the moment this gas is being moved by pipelines so there's no shipping involved at all. So if you fill your first ship today and ship it to China that won't come back for another 70 days. So in order to keep a steady stream of one ship of LNG arriving in a Chinese port every day you'll need another 69 of those ships just to keep that flow going. If you want to send two ships per day then obviously you'd need 140 ships. So this really just puts into perspective the amount of infrastructure that Russia will need to put into place to be able to start selling the gas that it's currently selling to Europe, to India or China. Really, really big problem, really big expense, really big technical challenges. And I think it's totally unrealistic to assume that Russia can simply pivot and sell all of this natural gas to other markets. It's just not practical. It's impossible for them to be able to do that. So the downside on Russia is going to be that they will lose all of these sales. That is going to have a huge impact on the Russian economy because Russia is dependent on oil and gas sales to the tune of around 60% of all of its revenues. So it's going to see a big fall in the amount of gas being sold. And that is going to hurt the Russian economy. And the other issue that we've got here is that these facilities have been set up to be operational. So if Russia can't find anywhere to move that gas to, then they're going to have to mothball these plants in the short term because there's nowhere that they can store all of this gas. They'll have to leave it in the ground. So that will then cause them other operational issues. So there are a lot of problems building here for Russia. In terms of the impact on the global economy, well, unfortunately, there's also some downside for the rest of us because the switch from buying gas in a gaseous form to LNG means that we're all going to have to bear higher costs. There's a lot more cost involved in all of the countries of Europe setting up LNG regasification facilities and buying LNG in the open markets. We've seen the price of LNG rise and we've also got the infrastructure costs. So that will feed through into higher energy costs 
and we've already got high inflation across the world. Higher energy costs will feed through into everything because gas is being used in industrial processes. It's purchased directly by consumers and it's also used to produce electricity. So that means that these higher costs will feed through into the price of everything. It will further drive inflation, put more pressure on the global economy at a time when we're looking at a global recession coming at some point in the next three to six months. So unfortunately, there is a lot of downside for the rest of us because it's driving up prices and that's going to be bad news for all of us. So hopefully you found today's video useful, informative and educational. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.